uh, I, let me introduce myself and then I'll introduce the presenters and, uh, and, and the commentators. Um, I'm Derek White, professor of history at African American Africana Studies here at the University of Kentucky. Um, thank you guys for uh, allowing me to participate. Uh, I want to introduce our four, or excuse me, our three uh, scholars that were presenting this afternoon. Um, we have, um, I'm going to do alphabetical order if that's okay with you guys. Mm -hmm. We should probably talk, we would have talked about this if it was a you know, in person, I could have whispered this, but now everyone has to hear my thinking. Um, <laughs> we'll start with Kate Aguilar, uh, who is going to present a paper entitled uh, The Rage to Win, Blackness, Masculinity, and the You in the Sun Belt South. Kate, you are at, um, I want to make sure, Gustavus Adolphus yeah, College? Yeah, Gustavus That's Adolphus College. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, and next, we will be followed by, uh, she will be followed by Christopher L. Stacy uh, at LSU Alexandria talking about populism. Uh, how do you say this? Kayfabe? Is this how we say this? Kayfabe. Kayfabe. Okay. I said it right. As a little Southern in me. Um, identity and professional wrestling in Southern political culture in the 70s and 80s. And last but not least, Chuck Westmoreland at Delta State University, a lousy sports town, Charlotte sports, and the question of a major league city, 1969 to 1988. Uh, and then comments by myself and Aram Gazuzian at the University of Memphis. Thank you guys for uh, all who are attending online. Uh, and Kate, the floor is yours. All right. I'm going to share my screen with you. Hopefully this you able to see. There we go. Okay. It took 13 minutes on May 17, 1980 for the clerk to read the verdicts from the all white, all male Tampa jury. All officers were acquitted in the McDuffie case, the murder of a 33 year old black insurance agent by up to a dozen white Dade County police officers. The shock throughout Black Miami was palpable. Major Clarence Dixon, the highest ranking Black police officer in the Miami Police Department explained all their grievances, all their distrust of the system, all the beliefs people had in the evil of the system, all they had thought was wrong. Suddenly it turned out to be true. By 6 p.m. the first rocks were thrown in the Northwest 62nd Street area of Liberty City. The 1980 Liberty City Rebellion lasted four days. From Liberty City to Coconut Grove to the Metro Justice Building, Miami was on fire. By May 20th, 10 black people and eight whites had died. Over 800 persons had been arrested and property damage exceeded $80 million. The City of Miami Police After Action Report centered black Miamians despair within the national economic recession and local competition for jobs and housing noting the recent influx of 30,000 Haitians and 35,000 Cubans. In a survey of Dade County Black residents by the Miami Herald and the Behavioral Science Research Institute of Coral Gables, 90% also listed police brutality as a major issue. The University of Miami was not isolated from the rebellion. On May 20th, the student organization United Black Students held a memorial service in honor of those who had died. The service entitled Justice is Dead reflected the campus community's concerns around police overreach. These concerns were captured in the report, The Black Experience at the University of Miami, published by the Committee on the Status of Blacks in 1976. The 44 page report observed that black students felt they were seen as guilty until proven innocent by campus security. And in fact, an incident with campus police led to the creation of the committee. University of Miami football players were also enmeshed in the racial politics of the period. Running back Melvin Bratton, who was from Liberty City and graduated from Miami Northwestern Senior High School stated, we were right there. My high school was right in the rebellion zone. We couldn't go to our homes, the city was burning. He continued, people had to take their hand and stick it out the car to identify them being black. Four years later, violence erupted again after the shooting of a 20 year old black man, Neville Johnson Jr at a video arcade and the subsequent acquittal by an all white jury of the Hispanic police officer. Cornerback Wayne Stark said, and I knew the guy, he was a neighbor of mine. James T, a popular radio host for local station Hot 105.1, argued that for the black community, such experiences to be black and an athlete were not mutually exclusive. Here the players were dealing with a city, 
a county, a community, a country that said, hey, if you're black, you are not really first class. And that's why you had some of the hungriest football players you've ever seen coming out of these communities, he explained. Yet histories of Miami have largely excluded exploration of how college football and its built environment shaped cultural politics on the local, national, and international stage. James T's reflection situates black players' rage to win within Southern history. This work argues analysis of the U of the 1980s is also critical for the field of African-American sports history. In the fall 2021 special issue, New Directions in African-American Sports History in the Journal of African-American History, historian Amira Rose Davis challenges scholars of race and sport to contextualize the black athlete within the larger framework of African-American history. This work explores how the racial and spatial politics of the Sunbelt South informed the framing of the Orange Bowl and the black athlete at the U. In turn, it asks, how does the black football player's success challenge Sunbelt boosterism? African-American history is a field grew out of the activism of the modern civil rights and black power movements. As studies of black life increased, so did the further excavation of black voices to tell their own stories. This paper contributes to this field by showing how the team's play exists within a longer history of racial and spatial exclusion in Miami and the Sunbelt. The city and the Orange Bowl grew up together, both shaped by Sunbelt boosterism, which obscured black contributions to the city and the team. The 1980s program's visibility was a reminder to all of America that such contributions could not be ignored. The growth of the Sun Belt or the development of suburbia after World War II from Virginia to California was the result of policies and practices upheld by the Federal Housing Administration and the GI Bill that reinforced residential segregation. In 1969, Republican strategist Kevin Phillips described the Sun Belt as a new alloy of conservatism that united voters across the southern rim of the country behind a pro-growth, pro-family, pro-defense, anti-labor, and anti-statist agenda. The myth of independence, which obscured the federal funding given to highways, low interest mortgages, and the building of stadiums like the Orange Bowl, allowed for a culture of localism. While football historically had been utilized by both liberals and conservatives to invoke U.S. values, during this period, the game gained popularity as representative of American exceptionalism. It became a particular tool of the right to quell American dissent as the clean cut white college football player represented the anti-hippie of the period. Football became a Cold War cultural text utilized to uphold the power of white men. Even after the sport was formally desegregated in 1972, racial stacking limited black players access to certain positions. Down the middle positions like linebacker and quarterback were considered too cerebral for black athletes and the utilization of black players in certain roles reinforced the type of white paternalism. Their limited play upheld that black players needed white leadership on and off the field. While football was becoming the national pastime during the 1970s, the moniker the New South gave way to the Sun Belt, an ideal that promised upward mobility for those who controlled political power and the built environment. The framework of the Sun Belt, or the geographic area located south of the 37th parallel, was the creation of white middle-class suburban spaces annexed by the city proper to ensure that whites maintain control of municipal politics. Stadiums grew up alongside strip malls, suburban communities, and prisons as a part of the radical reorganization of social space. In fact, religious leaders like Billy Graham, who represented Southern Progress, chastised Sun Belt cities that did not have a stadium in which to hold his rallies. The stadium, like the sport of football, symbolized regional progress. For the city of Miami, both the city and the Orange Bowl matured together. The city of Miami was incorporated in 1896, and the University of Miami formally opened its doors in October of 1926. The fledgling football program played in New Year's Day games in 1927, 1928, and 1929. By 1929, Miami businessmen had gathered to form the Greater Miami Athletic Association. The goal was that someday tourists from the U.S. North and Latin America would flock to Miami for football in the tropics. In 1976, promotional material for the Orange Bowl, Lou Price, director of the Miami Metro Department of Publicity and Tourism, sold the stadium as a part of this larger growth narrative. He talked about Miami's port, the nation's newest and most modern of transportation facilities, the largest cruise port in the United States, and the next paragraph celebrated the rise in Orange Bowl attendance from 5,134 spectators in 1934 to a sellout crowd of more than 80,000 in 1975. Sunbelt boosterism celebrated white suburbia and the political savvy of white evangelicals. The magic of Miami centered on a tourist progressive mystique that privileged the warm climate and contributions of white investors and eventually white Cubans 
while concealing how Black Miamians built the city and still struggled to gain access to its physical and political spaces. Historian Nathan Connolly explains, in the hundred years preceding World War I, the Florida territory fell mile by mile under the legal authority of the United States and the cultural authority of whiteness. The movement of largely white men, military men and their families to the region after World War II, the support of Anglo and white Cuban businesses in Miami to help defeat communist regimes like Fidel Castro's, and the role of college football and celebrating white masculine leadership in the 1960s, reinforce Miami as a part of a larger racial narrative. Importantly, such boosterism also opened the door for the integration of the U. The university's commitment to promoting cultural understanding among the Americas through the recruitment of Hispanic students and faculty brought the unintended consequence of bringing in Hispanic students of African descent. Their presence challenged the university's stance on racial segregation. The Board of Trustees eventually passed a policy to accept any qualified student in any of the schools or colleges of the university, regardless of race, creed, or color, on January 31st, 1961. The first Black student to formally enroll was Melvin R. Ladson, Jr., age 24. According to the Miami News, he was one of approximately 40 Black students taking classes in June of 1961. In December of 1966, the school accepted its first African-American football player, Ray Bellamy, and the University of Miami became the first major institution in the Deep South to have a Black football player on scholarship. In 1967, Harold Long and Willard Butler founded the student organization United Black Students. Despite such steps, integration proved difficult. In an October 26, 1962 article in the student newspaper, The Miami Hurricane, Gloria Collier stated, we get along just fine. Everybody ignores us and we ignore them, but you still don't get accustomed to indifference. Black athletes face similar struggles. In a December 1969 article in the Miami Hurricane, Bellamy stated, they will take a white athlete of average intelligence, but their black athletes have to be above average in everything. Another athlete was concerned about a potential quota system that limited the number of black athletes, and another mentioned the need for more black co coaches and the inclusion of black players into the white social scene. The most pressing issue was the arming of campus security, to which one athlete retorted, you watch and see, the first person to be shot on this campus will be a black. By 1974, 40 black players participated on the football team. The athletes' concern mirrored those of other black athletes at other predominantly white institutions, captured in Jack Olson's 1968 Sports Illustrated series, The Black Athlete, A Shameful Story. Even with a growing number of black athletes at the U and elsewhere, Orange Bowl material promoted white play. Black players were not visibly present in Orange Bowl promotional brochures until the late 1970s, and even when Black players did appear, it was often within the brochure, not on the cover. The most notable shift came on the cover of the promotional guide for the January 2nd, 1989 Orange Bowl between Miami and Nebraska, in which a Black player is shown elevated above and stiff-arming a white-appearing athlete. Most promotional materials instead marketed the enjoyment of white females. While the focus on white tourism was not unique to Miami, the connection of whiteness and football through the South strengthened the mystique of New South progressivism. The Sun Belt utilized football to illustrate industrial growth, technical sophistication, and an image of progress and respectability that combated perceptions of an abject South. The gaze of the Northern white female finding enjoyment in Miami through sport bolstered South Florida as America's playground. A 1964 promotional brochure for the 30th Orange Bowl Festival exemplifies this trend showcasing five white women standing on the beach, smiling for the camera. The caption reads, two glorious weeks of football, fun, and sunshine. Sun Colony presented similar imagery in 1960. In an article, Bowl Activity Florida Style, the magazine celebrates bowl queen Nancy Wakefield and her all-white court enjoying a romp in the ocean before returning to their royal duties. One of the women is clutching a football, connecting white sporting culture and white tourism to the Florida coast. Sport was a vehicle through which Northern whites gained access to and appreciated Southern culture. A black beauty queen did not appear in promotional material until 1980. Both race and sport were thus used to encourage a certain type of tourism to Miami and the framing of Miami as a national player. Such materials downplayed the importance of black labor to Miami's history. Between 1896 and 1920, Bahamian men helped clear the city's road and constructed many of its homes and hotels. More Bahamian black men and women chose South Florida as their destination than any other place. Dade County had two small but entrenched communities in the 1880s. Black residents made up 30% of Miami's population by 1920, and the vote to establish the city relied heavily on black residents, 
162 of 367 voters were black. This type of boosterism also concealed the significance of black athletic talent to the youth. Kim Sands, the first black woman to receive an athletic scholarship in tennis in 1974, credits trailblazers like herself and Bellamy for bringing national attention to the U. Another shift happened in 1979 with the hiring of coach Howard Schnellenberger. The team had a 38.5 winning percentage in the 1970s. By 1979, the university was giving away free tickets at the local Burger King to try to stimulate attendance. What set Schnellenberger's approach apart was that he recruited from predominantly black areas among other neighborhoods within South Florida. Liberty City native and rapper Luther Campbell recalls, the community had a lot of respect for the fact that he would take these types of individuals and take them down there to Coral Gables and at that time. In 1980, Coral Gables was a place black people did not go, often for fear of getting harassed by the police. Of the approximately 45,000 residents who lived in Coral Gables, only around 4% were black. Schnellenberger was determined to make the U a hometown team. By 1983, one third of the team was now from the Miami area. Alonzo Highsmith and Melvin Bratton, both black Miami natives, were two of the best prospects in the state. 12 players from the 1983 recruiting class played in the NFL, but it was more than talent that brought these athletes to the university. Several recognized that Schnellenberger recruited them without demanding they adhere to white sporting cultural norms. Black defensive back Tolbert Bain remembered, Miami got a lot of players, especially from our class, because they let you be the, yourself. In doing so, Schellenberger rebuffed Sunbelt politics and recognized Black contributions in a way New South boosterism never had. The result by 1983 was 11 consecutive wins and an Orange Bowl bid, the team's first visit to the bowl game in 33 years. Perhaps no coverage of the program's turnaround, including their first national championship win in 1984, was more compelling than that of the students themselves. Editor-in-chief for the Miami Hurricane, Ronnie Ramos wrote, how do you measure the impact of this game on the University of Miami? You never will. One thing is for certain, the University of Miami will never be the same. Calling it more than a game, Ramos recognized a cultural shift through this new recruiting strategy. Black athletic, athletic talent was putting the university, not just the Orange Bowl, on the map. The U was significant to the redefinition of popular conceptions of who could play and excel in college football, with Black players from the South leading the charge. Such success did not protect the team from the national racial politics of the Reagan era. In a 1980s political and popular culture obsessed with hard-bodied white masculinity, Miami was soon stereotyped in counter-distinction to predominantly white teams like Penn State. Football historian Michael Oria defines the 1980s and early 1990s as the tipping point when college football became more commercial spectacle than extracurricular activity. College football was one of the most publicized and profitable of America's sporting pastimes. To try to make sense of black athletic excellence in a way that upheld white masculine leadership, sports media amplified caricatures of black masculinity like the black brute. Framed within the racialized language of mass incarceration, the team was positioned as a national problem. In October of 1986, for example, Sports Illustrated journalist Rick Riley introduced America's number one team under the headline Miami Vice twice. He quipped, this is Miami's record, not football record, but police record. Remember 1985 All-America tight end Willie Smith, who after deciding to forego his final year of eligibility to enter the NFL draft, was arrested on cocaine and weapons charges last June? Since then, there have been fights and fraud and alleged shoplifting and other unsavory shenanigans involving more than 40 players, he wrote. Miami may be the only squad in America that has its team picture taken from the front and from the side. A year later, in a December 1987 article in the Chicago Tribune, Bad Guys Are Back, Robert Marcus wrote, once again, Miami is wearing the black hat. Even playing Oklahoma, a team everybody loves to hate, Miami is cast in the villain's role for Friday night's national championship showdown in the Orange Bowl. Members of the team had had run-ins with the law. The problem was that the press painted this criminal activity as a reflection of larger racial and regional deficiencies, a reality not specific to the framing of the white athlete. This image of the black athlete at the U as a national pop problem, Boutrous new right political rhetorics that conflated black masculinity, crime, Miami, and the war on drugs. Reaganism leaned on cities like Miami and teams like the U to strengthen the call for leaders like himself. On January 29, 1988, for example, he welcomed the championship college football team to the White House and reminded them to show grace and victory. This example of white paternalism, which used their play as a cautionary tale, positioned him as the rightful regulator of the global South. College athletic scandals were, of course, not specific to Miami. Fullback Alonzo Highsmith later recalled, 
we didn't have bad guys. Yeah, we might have had some guys who did stupid shit now and then, but people were making us out to be a bunch of gangsters and outlaws. We didn't have any drug problems, and we didn't have guys getting paid under the table by some rich boosters. We're not Oklahoma with these millionaire oil men. Quarterback Steve Walsh agreed, and a lot of other things don't get recognized, like Melvin Bratton working with youth groups, and I do some work with church groups. The criminalization of the U because of the actions of a few diminished how significant black men were to the rise of the city, the program, and the national prominence of the school. Regardless, inclusion of the black athlete at the U and their athletic excellence on the gridiron cemented the magic of Miami for many. Before these athletes, the team had only been featured once on television. The appearance at the Orange Bowl in 1984 was the team's 14th appearance, representing more than $4 million in revenue. By 1989, the team had won two more national championships and gained the reputation as the team of the 1980s. Home attendance had risen to 45,000, the highest since 1967. The 1980s program garnered several NFL draft records, and although difficult to correlate with football, Black attendance at the university was also on the rise. From a peak at 5.3% of the undergraduate population in 1975-76, Black students comprised 5.7% of the undergraduate student population in 1984, moving up to 7.1% in the fall of 1988. The success of the 1983-1984 National Championship team was read in conjunction with the 1980 Liberty City Rebellion. Player Eddie Brown stated, Miami no longer has to hear about the riots. They can talk about the championship game. To which player Jack Fernandez echoed, it doesn't matter what kind of accent you speak with or where you come from, for Miami's college football has brought everyone together. Journalist Dennis Murphy concurred, Miami's been waiting a long time to cheer together. 75,000 supporters gathered to celebrate the U. This work demonstrates, however, that this type of promotional press disguises the complexities of the Black athletic experience in South Florida. Some black athletes were both a part of the team's national success story and members of communities neglected by the city and Reaganomics. Their rage to win, their use of and commitment to the sport must not be separated from this longer history of racial and spatial exclusion that has come to define the Sunbelt era. Miami used the Orange Bowl to advance Sunbelt boosters in which centered white Americans play and simultaneously erased black contributions in the name of Southern progress. President Reagan, among others from the right, patronized the U and use the sport of college football to uphold white masculine cultural exceptionalism and the need for white leadership. Still, Black Miami refused to be ignored. My, black laborers built the city and redefined local culture, including sport in the process. Their history challenges the invisibility of the Black athlete in this regard to Miami's history. The Black athlete at the U's presence and play ultimately challenges sport, the political landscape, and Miami history as a white man's game. Thank you. Great job, Kate. Thank you um, for that that wonderful paper. Um, we're gonna keep it moving so we can then uh, get some comments from Aram and maybe from the audience uh, as well in the Q and A section. Um, uh, Chris, you're up next. Uh, thank you. I want to thank my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Wes Warland, for uh, oh. putting this. Uh, can can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to thank Chuck for putting this uh, panel together. It's just fan fantastic. As I was telling the group uh, beforehand, I, I wish we were all in person, but you got to roll with what you got. So anyway, a couple of things. This paper is part of a much larger project on the history of professional wrestling in the Deep South in a region that I call uh, – blatantly plagiarized from the Civil War historians, the Trans-Mississippi region. Uh, once upon a time, I was a Civil War guy, still a Civil War guy, but I got really interested in the history of, of, of wrestling, professional wrestling. Uh, so the Trans-Mississippi does encompass several territories, and I'll get to the territorial system in a minute, but basically it includes the states of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Tennessee, Mississippi and Alabama. So it's it's the region that the Civil War historians look at the Trans-Mississippi Theater. So I, I I blatantly used it as a sort of a geographical organizational uh, tool. Anyway, uh, the book and this paper is about professional wrestling in what was what's called scholars call the territorial period. Basically, 
during the territorial era before the advent of the WWE and oh, we have light. Uh, professional wrestling was basically run by an informal car cartel through what was called the National Wrestling Alliance. And each territory was its own economic and sporting entity. Uh, and there was an informal uh, arrangement among the promoters who own these territories that they would not encroach the borders. Well, of course, quite often they did. But anyway, that's sort of the, the larger contextual uh, explanation for this for this uh, essay. Uh, also, a definition of kayfabe. Kayfabe was the perception of the business, professional wrestling being real. Okay. Uh, now, of course, with the internet and uh, the information age, most everybody, I'm pretty sure some people still believe it's real, but most everybody, most of the consumers of professional wrestling know that uh, the product is choreographed. Don't say fake. Don't say the F word. Don't say fake. It's not fake, folks. They're doing real athletic. There's, there's genuine athletic competition going on. It's just the, of course, the matches are predetermined. I'm, I'm sorry to, to burst anybody's bubble who still believes that wrestling is on the up, up, but it's not. But during this time period, enough people believed Kayfabe is basically the definition of the perception of the believable, the believability of the business. This specific essay taps into uh, a wide array of identities that promoters and bookers uh, tapped into, uh, including but not limited to race, ethnicity, class, religion, gender, masculinity, femininity, femininity femininity and gender nonconformity. Uh, the use of these categories was within the context of the changing political culture of the 1970s and 80s. And the one overarching theme, and uh, Kate kind of tapped into it as well, is that there's this post-civil rights populist, little p populist, uh, and I define that term intentionally broad, not just sort of populism that we're all familiar with, which emerged in the uh, from the alliances. It's sort of this larger uh, racialized definition of that combines the, I call it sort of a toxic brew of xenophobia, racism, uh, economic uh, angst, uh, but. These, ter these various territories are tapping into in the storylines, in the characters, in the, uh, the feuds. They're tapping into this theme that kind of not jumps out, but it's, it's, it's evident enough that, you, that, that, that it sort of binds all of these, uh, these uses of these different, different identities. Uh, for example, uh, race. Uh, one of the most popular performers in the Mid-South Territory, which is, I look a lot at the Mid-South, was the Junkyard Dog. Who remembers the Junkyard Dog? Any wrestling fans in here? Well, the Junkyard Dog was one of the most popular African-American wrestlers, and he got over in the Mid-South, in the Deep South, specifically in New Orleans, which is why I'm I decided to roll with this chapter instead of Andy Kaufman in Memphis. Anyway, uh, Bill Watts was the owner and booker. Well, he booked, he had the final say. He had a regular uh, booker, two regular bookers, Ernie Ladd and, and uh, Bill Dundee, uh, but also uh, Jake the Snake's father. But anyway, uh, Watts decided, and I'm assuming it's Watts because Watts, often says he doesn't see race, but Watts sees race, right? And a good example is uh, in a loser leave town match, basically they put a, a mask on JYD to include him still in the territory. In other words, they're, they're, they're gimmicking him leaving the territory. They put a mask on him and they call him Stagger Lee. 
And I did some research on Stagger Lee, and lo and behold, there's this incredibly nuanced story about a murder. Uh, and I'll just read part of the essay here, underscoring the subtlety of Watts, uh, Watts's utilization of race in his approach to booking. He had JYD put on a mask and come back as Stagger Lee. The fact that Stagger Lee was JYD was obvious. The symbolism of his name, not so much. Mid-South African-Americans were the most likely fan demographic to know the meaning of the Stagger Lee gimmick. The name came from scores of blues ballads recounting the story of an infamous murder in, Saint, in a St. Louis bar involving two black men. In 1895, on Christmas Eve, Stagger Lee Shelton and Billy Lyons got into a heated discussion over politics and a Stetson hat. The end result was Stagger Lee shooting Billy Lyons. The murder was immortalized in African-American blues as part of the story of black masculinity and betrayal. Uh, the point here is that uh, there's some incredible nuance and thought going into reaching a demographic, which is pretty typical of, of these promotions, which are distilling these, these gimmicks and characters, the nuance into sort of simple dichotomy of good guy versus bad guy. But if you, but, and, and I'm assuming here that Somebody, whether it be JYD or Watts, had some sort of passing knowledge of, of this, the existence of this, uh, this type of folklore. Uh, the other blatant one, and I'm, 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 I kind of crossed it out because of time, uh, Kamala is a very, very simplistic caricature of an African. Uh, uh, Harris was his real name. He was from Coldwater, Mississippi, but that gimmick was... Uh, in a lot of primary sources, they knew what they were doing. Uh, uh, James Harris himself comments in his book, I knew it was a racialized gimmick and tapping into a stereotype, but I want to make some money. Uh, I kind of tap into as a theoretical basis for this chapter, uh, although I didn't understand most of it, Edward Said's Orientalism is sort of a... a a, a much larger theoretical basis for essentializing others. Uh, so again, there's some, there's some theoretical basis for what these bookers and owners of these territories are doing to create wrestling characters to build storylines, feuds. And, and of course their ultimate objective is to make money. Okay. Uh, one of the interesting things too, they do is to, the, the ethnic bad guy, here was, we begin with post-World War II Nazis, but of course Japanese Americans were depicted as, as uh, bad guys, heels. Uh, one of the most interesting characters uh, was a man by the name of Skandar Akbar, real, uh, real name Jimmy Saeed Weba. Uh, he basically depicted this stereotypical Middle Eastern uh oil mogul, I guess is the best uh, word to uh, describe him. And, and they booked him in deliberate storylines that tapped into uh, Americans in the 70s and 80s, growing suspicion and mis misperceptions and depictions of people from the, the Middle East. And of course, this is happening during right on the heels of uh, uh, the hostage crisis and, and the oil embargo. So there's some really thoughtfulness to whipping up the crowds and building storylines and building characters. Cold War villains is another one that's pretty common. Uh, Russians who weren't really Russians were depicted within the milieu of, of uh, Cold War politics. But again, all of these characters or gimmicks are set in a much larger context of the new right and the emergence of what I call sort of little peak populism in the South, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a relatively new field of, of his, historiography that historians are just now getting into, especially looking at the South. But this populism to this nuance of populism emerges within the fabulous Freebirds. Now, by first glance, the Freebirds 
uh, were to a, a tag team, a, a, a six man tag. There were three of them. And they came to the ring wearing Confederate robes. Now, at first glance, you're, you're going to say, well, they're tapping into the lost cause and Southerners' affinity for the, the, the Confederate flag. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. They were bad guys. They were heels. So my question is, why in the hell are the Freebirds heels and they're wearing Confederate robes? Well, you got to look a little closer again in that they're kind of their feud with the uh with the von erics it was sort of it tapped into the state uh, a state rivalry between uh texas and georgia and they came out to the 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 song uh free Bird. so there's this sort of long-haired you know uh dirty white boy white trash image versus the the clean cut image of the Von Erics and the Von Erics were a vaunted uh, uh, Texas family of wrestlers. Very tra uh, tragic story behind them. But there again, there's some thought and nuance and it's taking into account a lot of political, cultural and social uh, developments in the 70s and 80s. Uh, another one is Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette, uh, who was a manager. This kind of taps into the class aspect of this little pea populism and that he was a mama's boy. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. It's just tapping into perceptions about concentrated wealth. Uh, Jim Cornette was a heel manager, carried a, a, a tennis racket. So you're tapping into a lot of 1980s uh, growth, uh, economic growth there and the sort of the, the economic dynamic of populism. Uh, moving on. Gender, I think. Uh, women. One of the most interesting things in this chapter that I found was, of course, women in the 70s and 80s began to be depicted more beyond just ballets. They're starting to participate in angles and obviously they're depicted as having a lot of, uh, uh, you know, as eye candy and sex appeal, but gender nonconformity to me is the most fascinating uh, sort of uh, gender aspect of, of, of creating characters in, in storylines. Uh, in the 1960s, Adrian Street, exotic Adrian Street, who was from Wales, uh, developed this gimmick where he was a cross-dresser. And this, again, this goes back to, uh, you know, Gorgeous George and how he got over as a, as a uh, not necessarily a homosexual, but, in, and again, I use gender nonconformity because think of gold dust. Gold Dust is not necessarily a homosexual character. He's not necessarily a cross-dresser. He's something else. He's not heterosexual, right? So Adrian Street, I'm sorry. I got to shut up. Anyway, Adrian Street, again, was depicted as a bad guy. So uh, I'm looking at several categories here. And just to conclude, why? Why are these bookers creating these storylines and characters with some nuance and tapping into all of these identities which are transforming? Money. They want to draw uh, an, in, uh, an increasingly interracial audience, but they want to maximize their profits and, and keep people tuning in and going to the ring or going to the matches. Anyway, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was a fascinating uh, uh, discussion about wrestling in, the, in 1970. I can just speak on uh, uh, the, all that was familiar. And so I, I appreciate you thinking, thinking through the ways in which uh, Booker's and, and, and these Mid-South regions, uh, these regions, excuse me, uh, developed uh, these characters and stereotypes. And so I, I look forward to that. Last but not least, uh, we have Chuck. Bring us home. All right. Ooh. 
Was that flashing? Yes, sir. Uh, let me let me see how I can get this. Let's try again. Okay. How's that? Can everyone see that? Hear me okay? Okay. Thanks. Um, so thanks to uh, everyone uh, for uh, being part of this uh, session. Um, I've enjoyed the papers and definitely look forward to hearing uh, the comments. Uh, my paper, which uh, is, as Dr. White said, uh, about a lousy sport town, um, is part of a larger project that I'm working on uh, related to Charlotte and its sporting culture since World War II. Uh, so this is, I'm at the beginning of the project. Um, but what I'm really looking at here are several questions about sport and identity, um, and particularly sport within the urban context. Um, what's, what does the history of sport reveal about Charlotte and its identity through a period of immense social, political, economic, and cultural change? Uh, what roles did sport play in the shaping of the Sunbelt South? And then really more broadly, which I think all of us are, are doing here, is trying to understand what does sport tell us about a particular place. Um, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to Charlotte, and, I, and I'll get back to the, the home slide for a second, uh, but when it comes to the uh, place of Charlotte uh, sports and scholarship, there's really not much that's been written. Um, several pieces of scholarship will mention the arrival of the Charlotte Hornets of the NBA and the Carolina Panthers of the NFL in the 1980s and 1990s as an example of how Charlotte had made it big time, that it had finally attracted major uh, professional sports franchises in the late 80s and the early 90s was a pivotal moment in that process of, of Charlotte really flourishing into a major league city. Uh, this was also taking place at the time in which Charlotte was going through a lot of banking um, uh, the explosion of the banking industry and some co consolidation that had made uh, Charlotte one of the top banking centers in the United States. So sports went along with that in the arrival of Charlotte as a, a major league uh, city. Uh, there is a scholarship, uh, some really fine scholarship that deals with other aspects of North Carolina sporting culture, uh, certainly scholarship on NASCAR. I'm thinking of Dan Pierce's terrific book, uh, Real NASCAR. And then also a scholarship on uh, college basketball. Uh, Pam Grundy's uh, book, Learning to Win, is, a, uh, is, is excellent at looking at the high school and college sporting culture of North Carolina. But uh, there, there's really nothing in depth about the role that sports have played in Charlotte in the 20th century, especially after World War II. Uh, so that's part of the, you know, the, the bigger goal here in my, in my, my project. This specific paper is, is really concerned with what happens before Charlotte becomes this major league city and before the Hornets arrive, and certainly earlier than the arrival of the Panthers in the 1990s. And so what I wanted to do in the paper is lay out the context of how Charlotte as a city was changing after World War II uh, in terms of economic growth and development, suburbanization, uh, the civil rights revolution, and how Charlotte responded to that um, but then also uh, look at how people of Charlotte, uh, particularly looking at the press, uh, urban boosters, um, debated Charlotte's status as a sports city. And so that's where this, uh, the title of the paper comes from. And uh, that is not a picture of me on the screen. Um, that was <laughs> Carolina Cougars uh, coach Larry Brown. Uh, who is currently an assistant coach at uh, Dr. Gonzusian's institution, the University of Memphis basketball team. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, just to set up the, the background here, um, this was 1974. Uh, the Carolina Cougars were a member of the American Basketball so Association, the ABA. As you can see in the background, the red, white, and blue ball, and there's the Cougars logo. Uh, the Cougars, uh, the previous year, had uh, gone to the Eastern Conference Finals, and in the regular season, they had the best record in the ABA, but they fell, they fell short in the Eastern Conference Finals to the Kentucky Colonels. Um, the following year, they had had a 73-74. They had a pretty solid season going. Um, but attendance in Charlotte was not very good. And as I'll talk about, the Carolina Cougars franchise was set up in a very interesting way. They had rotating um, – they played rotating home games throughout the state. But um, – <clears throat> The Carolina Cougars were hemorrhaging money, and their ownership uh, had reached out to uh, the city fathers of Greensboro, 
the business and political leadership in Charlotte, and they were essentially trying to get a bailout. They were trying to get a guarantee on ticket sales, uh, better rents at the uh, at, at, at the Coliseum, and they were uh, they were trying to get one of these cities to save them. And Larry Brown was asked about what what might happen to the Cougars. You know, would they be leaving uh, the state of North Carolina? Um, could they did they have a stable home in, in the state? And he specifically pointed out Charlotte, and I'll just read his uh, his quote. He said, I don't think we should play in Charlotte. People will get mad at me, but I think Charlotte is a lousy sports town. All they're interested in is stock car racing. And um, this, this comment really, really resonated, um, not just in the short term, but over the next couple of decades. And, um, and so what I really focus on here in the paper is, uh, the context of Charlotte sporting culture, the Carolina Cougars, and then this period in the 70s and 80s where Charlotte's going through an identity crisis um, of what kind of city does it want to be. Uh, Matthew Lassiter talks about this as an era where Charlotte was searching for respect uh, on the regional, but, but even more so on the national stage. And so if we, uh, just, to, just to give a little more context of, of sports in, in, in Charlotte, uh, after World War II, the Charlotte Coliseum, uh, which is today known as the Bojangles Coliseum, it's gone through several different names. Um, this was the primary sports venue in Charlotte. It opened in 1955, and I also thought it was uh, very fitting that uh, Kate referenced uh, Billy Graham at the at the Orange Bowl and how Billy Graham uh, was a, a leading booster throughout the South for stadiums so he could have his uh, his crusades. Um, but Billy Graham in 1955, along with the governor of North Carolina, Luther Hodges, uh, led the dedication of the Charlotte uh, of the Charlotte Coliseum. This is one of my favorite photographs ever uh, <laughs> from the uh, from the 1970s. Uh, this is outside of the Charlotte Coliseum and auditorium. There was also an adjacent auditorium built um, uh, in 1955. It's called Ovens Auditorium. And uh, it gives you a rundown of the upcoming uh, of the upcoming events. Uh, there's the Billy Graham Crusade, professional wrestling, uh, Elvis, and then ice hockey. Um, and so, so the the Coliseum was the prime venue for sports from the 1950s through the 1980s, and it's still in existence. Uh, it still holds a variety of events. Um, of course, Charlotte today has a as a downtown arena um, where the uh, the current version of the Charlotte Hornets play. Um, what did Charlotte have in terms of sports uh, before the arrival uh, or before the arrival of the Hornets? Uh, the Charlotte Checkers played for uh, about 20 years uh, from the 1950s through the uh, late 1970s in the Charlotte Coliseum. Uh, they, they drew pretty good crowds, of course, especially when they were winning. Uh, the, uh, the city of Charlotte flirted briefly with professional football in the form of the World Football League in uh, 1974 uh, and 1975, um, but the league uh, the league shut down fairly fairly quickly, and this uh, you can see is the uh, what their uniforms look like. Um, but in terms of major professional sports, prior to the arrival of the Hornets and the Panthers, uh, the prime game in town was the Carolina Cougars. Now the Carolina Cougars were uh, originally owned by Jim Gardner, who you see here to the left handing the famed red, white, and blue ball of the ABA uh, to the first head coach of the Cougars, Bones McKinney, who uh, had been a longtime ACC coaching legend at Wake Forest University. Uh, Jim Gardner was uh, involved in the fast food business. He was one of the founders of Hardy's Restaurants and uh, a leading figure in Republican politics in North Carolina in the 1960s, uh, really from the 1960s through the 1980s. Uh, Gardner uh, had served as a member of Congress in the late 60s, and then he would go on to become lieutenant uh, governor um, in the in the 1980s. Uh, he, he, he ran for major statewide office numerous times. He, he lost more often than he won. But he um, and the Southern Sports Corporation were the, the owners of the Cougars. Uh, the Cougars played in the ABA. Uh, here is a great map of the different franchises. In the American Basketball Association, the, uh, the the franchise lineage goes back to the Houston Mavericks, who played two years 
uh, in the first two years of the ABA. And the Mavericks uh, drew extremely poor attendance. Uh, there are many stories of uh, players who, who went to Houston and they could count the, the number of, of fans in the, in, in the stands pretty, pretty easily. Uh, and in some cases, they, they didn't even draw 100, 100 people. Um, so Gardner bought the Cougars from uh, the Houston, uh, bought the, uh, the organization um, in 1969. Now, the, the, the Carolina Cougars were uh, a unique franchise in that era. Um, they did not have one home city. Even though they were headquartered in Greensboro, uh, they played a series of games in, uh, in, in Greensboro, Charlotte, and then Raleigh. Now, the idea for the regional franchise uh, came from a 1968 Sports Illustrated article by Frank DeFord. And Frank DeFord was talking about the problems in, of, of the economics of sports uh, across the different leagues. And he, he talked about basketball running the risk of having too many teams and too many games and that the product was going to become oversaturated. And he, he, he discussed in this article about how bigger cities like New York, certainly Los Angeles, Boston, um, could succeed and do very well in terms of drawing fans. Uh, but when it came to some of the medium sized cities, uh, that's where a lot of struggle, uh, a, lot, a lot of struggles uh, were, were, being, uh, were, were being faced at the box office. And so in the article, DeFord proposed that North Carolina would be the ideal place to have a regional franchise where in effect you could you could spread the wealth of the games throughout different cities. It would make each game something bigger in that location. Uh, and so this uh, this this drawing here comes from the 1968 Sports Illustrated article. Um, Jim Gardner and, and Jim Gardner's brother uh, had read the, had read the piece and thought it was a great idea. Uh, the ABA uh, entry fee was 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 pretty low, so it, it gave 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 more more businessmen the opportunity to buy into the league. And so um, uh, the Carolina Cougars uh, uh, were formed in 1969 after moving from um, Houston. Uh, the Cougars had a very regional flavor, like a lot of uh, ABA teams. They uh, they drafted uh, and signed players who were from colleges in, 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 the, in that state or in nearby states. Uh, the Cougars wanted to sign players that would be familiar with uh, their fan bases in, in Greensboro and Raleigh and in Charlotte. Uh, and so the profile that you see over here to the left is of the first, uh, first group of Carolina Cougars. Uh, Bob Verga, who was the leading scorer on the team, he played at Duke. Uh, Randy Mahaffey was, was from Clemson, so not too far from Charlotte, uh, just across the state line in, in South Carolina. Uh, Gene Littles, who played uh, at High Point, he was the first African American athlete at High Point College, now University. Uh, Bill Bunting, Doug Moe, um, missing someone. Uh, George Peoples, if I'm not mistaken, played at the University of, of North Carolina. So roughly half of the roster was filled with uh, North Carolina college players, people that would have been familiar. Uh, to their fan base. And uh, of, of all of the players that came through the Carolina Cougars organization for five years, uh, and there were many because there was so much roster turnover in the ABA, uh, Gene Littles was the only player to play all five years uh, with the Cougars. Um, but the Cougars, uh, despite some success in their two final years, uh, were not long for the state of North Carolina. Um, the, they were hemorrhaging money, and the owner, Ted Munchak, who was not from North Carolina, he, he lived in Atlanta, he was a Georgia businessman, uh, sold the Cougars to uh, brothers Ozzy and Daniel Silna, who took the organization and put it in St. Louis and became the Spirits of St. Louis. Um, the, the departure of the Cougars sparked what I call a postmortem of, of, of that organization, but a much deeper conversation about Charlotte's place within the national sporting landscape. Uh, Larry Brown's comment, lousy sport town, sports town, sparked much conversation. And then you had headlines and stories and editorials throughout uh, really the next decade or so uh, uh, on whether or not Charlotte could support professional sports. Um, Charlotte had done well in um, supporting and promoting um, sporting events, big time sporting events such as NASCAR races, 
uh, professional wrestling, which would come through several times a month. But when it came to the steady grind of a franchise that required additional support almost night after night after night, that was where Charlotte had struggled. And so this article here from 1975 talks about Charlotte as a sporting graveyard. And, and so over, over the next uh, decade, you got different explanations and different answers to this question about can Charlotte support professional sports and was it a lousy sports town? Uh, the boosters in Charlotte were very defensive of the city. And particularly when it came to the Carolina Cougars, the defenders usually said, hey, the Cougars were not Charlotte's team. Uh, the Cougars were really Greensboro's team. Uh, and, and various writers and members of the team often talked about how the uh, Greensboro seemed to get the best matchups that were going to draw more uh, draw more people in attendance. And Charlotte and then and then Raleigh by the, the about by 1974 were, were getting the leftovers. And the argument from Charlotte's boosters, um, from the Chamber of Commerce through the press, said that Charlotte was a good sports town, but it wasn't just going to support any franchise simply because it was major league. That the product had to be promoted well, there had to be close cooperation and buy-in from the business community. Um, and also uh Charlotte did have other options of sports uh, in terms of live sports options, but also television. Um, and one of the common uh, common remarks made about why the Cougars didn't succeed in North Carolina uh, came down to college basketball. And that if people in Charlotte could watch a primetime game involving UNC, NC State, Duke, Many of them would choose that rather than going and paying a ticket at the Coliseum to see uh, to see the Cougars. And so college basketball uh, was seen as a form of competition um, uh, to uh, to the Cougars, but also a form of competition around the state um, and, and a competition for places like Greensboro and, and Raleigh. Um, one of the common arguments uh, made by supporters of of Charlotte becoming a major league city and attracting a big franchise was that um, Charlotte had the, the income, Charlotte had the sporting fan base, but Charlotte by the 1970s and early 80s needed a new Coliseum. So we get into much discussion, bond debates, bond votes by the early 1980s uh, involving whether or not to use public funding to build uh, a new Coliseum. And this 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 image here from the Charlotte Observer shows possible possible sites. Um, today, the arena for the for the Charlotte Hornets is uptown. Um, later uh, or earlier, the Charlotte Hornets would build an arena off of uh, Billy Graham Parkway um, outside of the outside of the center city. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up here because I know we're running out of time. But um, where 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 my story progresses here. And moving forward with the larger project is, is wanting to look at the lead up to the arrival of the Charlotte Hornets. Um, in 1981, uh, the city of Charlotte voted on a bond to um, to uh, provide funding for the creation of a new coliseum, also uh, greater greater funding for infrastructure, roads, sewage systems, and that bond failed. There was another bond vote in 1984, and by that time, the mayor of the city was Harvey Gantt. Uh, Harvey Gantt was the first uh, African American mayor of Charlotte. Um, he uh, he was an African American mayor in a predominantly white city, um, and 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 Gantt had and would form very close bonds with Charlotte's white business community. And um, for those aspiring to be able to bring in a professional sports franchise, NBA, for example, they knew that Charlotte needed to have a coliseum ready and waiting. And so on, uh, in June, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in, in November of 1984, um, the city of Charlotte ended up voting yes on, uh, on a bond program. Harvey Gantt was pounding the pavement, uh, really seeking public support for this so that the vote would succeed. Um, advertisements like this were, uh, were, were printed constantly through uh, the Charlotte Post, which was Charlotte's African-American uh, newspaper. And, um, and the bond ended up uh, succeeding. And over the next, I'll move forward here so we can wrap up. 
Um, over the next several years, um, businessman George Shin, uh, who had uh, made his made his money as um, the owner of business colleges and also as a motivational speaker. He spoke a lot at churches. Um, he was a uh, 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 very much a disciple of Norman Vincent Peale. And um, effectively, Shin and Gant, along with business forces in the city, um, rallied, really rallied the community together uh, to, um, uh, to ultimately win an NBA franchise in 1987. And so this is the article from the Charlotte Observer uh, when uh, the NBA's board voted to approve the uh the placing of a franchise in Charlotte. And uh, even before the Hornets took the court, the city held a parade for them. And you can see George Shin and Harvey Gant riding in the car in the parade uh, to the adoring crowd. Um, and in 1988, the Hornets would begin play. Um, and Charlotte uh, could say to itself uh, that it was a major league city. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll close up and turn it over to uh, the commentators. Great, great job by um, all three of you. Uh, those are fascinating papers about uh, the intersections of sports and regional identity. Um, Aram, I'll let you uh, open the comments and then I'll, I'll chime in and then, and then we'll see if there's any in the chat. Um, question and answer i think is that where we're supposed to yes so if you have if if you're here and you want to put a question in use please use the q a uh, i'll be monitoring that as well uh floor is yours aaron thank you derek i am now an old man so i have to wear my reading glasses while i do this um thank you to our three panelists uh those were all uh, very interesting papers very well researched um and i also want to commend the panel for really finding subjects that really intersect with each other. Uh, there's a lot of overlap here in themes and ideas uh, that can really help us sort of more broadly consider uh, the idea of the Sun Belt and the role that sports uh, play in it. My only regret is that we're doing this virtually and not meeting for Sazeracs and Beignets and Po' Boys afterwards. Um, okay. Together, I think these three papers illustrate a lot of the major forces that are shaping Southern identity in the 1970s and 1980s, the Sunbelt mentality of civic boosterism and economic growth in a way that kind of papers over the racial strife and the inequality of Southern history. Uh, in the case of sports, we see that, for instance, through stadium building, through business leaders calling for big time sports as a marker of civic identity. Uh, we also see the complexities of African-American identity uh, in the post-civil rights era. Uh, we see that especially through Kate's paper with the frustrations of the Miami football players who have this stigma of criminals. But we also see it in the construction of some of the uh, uh, Southern wrestling characters like Christopher talked about, like Junkyard Dog or Kamala, the Uga Ugandan giant. Uh, and we also see the rise of this forceful white Southern populism uh, that's really starting to shape the nation's political realignment. Um, and the fabulous free birds are, of course, a dramatic example of that. Uh, to quote from Christopher's paper, they're the, quote, dirty peckerwood rednecks with long hair who came out of the hills of Georgia or the mean streets of Atlanta. I got to say, these papers also had me reflecting on my own sports fandom as a youth. Uh, when I was a kid, like Derek, I marveled at the acrobatics of the Von Erich brothers. I loved the junkyard dog. Um, but I also found myself reflecting on why I cheered against the Miami football teams of the 1980s. Uh, I remember in the Nebraska uh, game in the 1984 Orange Bowl or the famous Catholics versus convicts game against Notre Dame. Uh, and that was a choice undoubtedly shaped by the racial narratives of the of the time and also my own racial biases, right? Uh, I'm neither connected to a, well, you know, I was a Armenian kid from Boston and yet I was identifying with white Nebraskans and Catholics. Um, so, you know, it spoke, it spoke to, uh, I think, to a lot of the themes that, that Kate was trying to get us to think about. Um, Reading Chuck's paper actually got me thinking about a more recent experience. When I first moved to Memphis in 2004, uh, the Memphis Grizzlies had moved there three years earlier, uh, and they were a very good team at the time, or at least a, a quite good team. They had a young Pau Gasol. They won 50 games every year. Hubie Brown was a coach then. Um, but there was very relatively little fan enthusiasm for the team. It didn't seem like they were part of the city yet in the way that, for instance, the college basketball team, the Memphis Tigers, were. Uh, it would take the next generation teams, the Zach Randolph and Mike Conley, to really create an identity that was connected to the city. 
And it was kind of a reminder to me of that sort of complex nature of sports fandom itself. Uh, when you cre to create a connection between a team and a city, uh, it's more than just the demographic profile that Frank DeFord wrote about in 1968, right? Uh, that you need an emotional or a spiritual or a personal component to that. And so in Chuck's paper, a lousy sports town, Charlotte and the quest for a major league city, 1974 to 1988, right? Uh, he's talking, talking about a, a distinct city from Memphis in Charlotte in a different period, right? Charlotte, unlike Memphis, really embraced that New South identity. Memphis really failed to do that. Uh, it had a very forward-looking elite that was rooted in business development, that projected this ideal of racial harmony, uh, and used tried to use sports anyway as a signifier of that larger mentality, right? Uh, so as uh, Chuck's uh, paper discussed, right, you have this nexus of Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro, Winston-Salem uh, that can be the base for a big league sports franchise. But as the experience of the Carolina Cougars shows us, right, that's not an automatic qualifier for sports enthusiasm. Um, I thought the great strength in Chuck's paper, but also what I wanted to know more about uh, and to build upon was in these years, 74 to 88, uh, thinking about that sports vacuum as a vehicle for how the people of Charlotte see their own city, right? If there's no pro sports franchise, then who are they, right? Uh, and this seems to be a question that a lot of cities are asking themselves in the same period. Uh, and I think it might be fruitful just for context to think a little bit more about how this is going on all around the country. Uh, I know from when I was writing the Bill Russell book, for instance, that uh, Seattle was going through these conversations in the 70s with, with the pilots and then ultimately with the Sonics. Um, but I think it's going on at every sort of second tier city. You know, Memphis, where I live now, of course, was a constant place for expansion franchises because it's kind of that next tier city, right? That doesn't necessarily have one. Um, but it's also, I think, the uh, the real arena for development, uh, if this is going to be a book project, is to think a little bit more about um, those civic boosters, about the Jim Gardners, about the George Shins, right? In a lot of ways, you're telling a story about uh, this kind of, that, I, that seems to me like uh, common in the South, these white entrepreneurs who uh, envision a place for their city uh, and that's some combination of civic pride, some combination of ego, some combination of economic self-interest, some combination of, of civic good, right? Uh, and thinking more about these sometimes larger than life personalities and, and, and sort of the, the incredible influence that they can have over, over the course of the city, right? Um, it's a handful of people sometimes who are really dictating what makes Memphis go down and what makes Charlotte go up in these same years, you know? Um, in your paper, you'd also mentioned about how the African-American community really got behind the bond issue um, uh, that ultimately built the stadium that attracted uh, the Hornets. And I was curious to, to learn more about that. Uh, was there any fallout? Was it because of the association with, with Mayor Gant? Uh, it was, it was, it was a, a little side note in there, but, but it did strike my interest, and I wondered if there was more to develop with that. Um, so yeah, I think these are, this was a, an outstanding paper. I, I was curious more about that sort of thinking about the general tenor of expansion in this period because you've got the you know, the World Hockey League, the ABA in basketball, the WHA, the uh, football, you know, various football expansion leagues, including the USFL in the 1980s. Uh, think about sort of like the work of Thomas Aiello that I know you cited and with basketball. He's starting to touch on that with Southern identity. Uh, I'm going to move on to Kate's paper. Uh, the, uh, Kate Aguirre is The Rage to Win, The Black Athlete and the You in the Sun Belt South. I thought this paper was really perceptive in capturing the tensions and the experience of a black athlete at, at a predominantly white institution, right? Uh, they're, they're held up to this heroic standard. They're central to the prestige of the institution and to its growth. But at the very same time, they're stigmatized and they're subject to, to exploitation. Right? Um, but in this case, the context is a somewhat unique city uh, of Miami, right? Uh, given its South Florida location, given the Cuban population, uh, in some ways, Miami is, of course, distinct from much of the Deep South while at the same time having this adhere historic adherence to Jim Crow, white supremacy that we associate with the Deep South, right? Uh, and I thought Kate's paper was wonderful at setting up the swirling context uh, in which to understand the place of, of the African-American football players at the U. The Liberty City Riot in 1980, which speaks to the rage and frustrations of second-class citizenship for, uh, for many African-Americans in this post-civil rights era. Uh, the Sunbelt Boosterism, that was also there uh, in Chuck's essay with Miami civic leadership. Reflecting the construction of the Orange Bowl and a, and a, a, prom, a promotion of tourism. Uh, University of Miami has this tradition of racial liberalism for the South, right, with its early integration and then with, uh, especially in, in the sports realm, with Howard Schnellenberger's teams. But it's also, as Kate was, was, was documenting quite clearly, 
uh, racial marginalization at the same time, right? Uh, marketing football is white. Uh, mocking the football program is criminals, right? As we saw with the Rick Riley column. Uh, so Kate sees here an, in, uh, an invis quote, invisibility to the black athletic experience. I think that's a, that's a key central insight uh, and one that maybe you can elaborate upon uh, as the project goes forward. Uh, reading, reading your essay, I was really thirsting for more about the players themselves. Uh, uh, what can we? What do we know about an Alonzo Highsmith or a Melvin Bratton? Uh, you know, you, you quote from them, but uh, I think a more biographical approach here uh, and a more um, personal, emotional connection to the experiences of the players uh, could actually flesh out the larger structural uh, theme themes that you're really um, that you're really uh, talking about here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure this is part of a larger project, but I, I was curious if there was more that you were going to do with. The bigger sports media narratives where that the University of Miami is at the center of in the 1980s, right? Uh, in terms of the uh, the 84 Orange Bowl, for instance, um, with the Catholics versus convicts game that I've uh, with Notre Dame in 1988, the association with uh, Luther Campbell and Two Life Crew, uh, the um, instances where the criminality of, of the team is is heightened. Um, I guess more sort of. If there's more sort of on the ground reporting uh, that, that we can do through the media, I think that would also help to uh, create a narrative arc. Uh, and maybe that, that is part of your larger project, but uh, I was curious about it as, as I was reading you. Uh, and finally, uh, we go to Christopher Stacey's uh, Populism and Kayfabe Identity and Professional Wrestling in Southern Political Culture in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, as Christopher so uh, does so well, he shows us that pro wrestling is really a unique opportunity to kind of deconstruct regional identity, right? Because pro wrestling skirts that line between sport and theater. Uh, it explicitly creates characters who are designed to uh, elicit emotional reactions, right? We've got the baby faces, we've got the heels. Uh, and to do that, you have to play on the popular attitudes of the era, the politics, and also the racial and ethnic prejudices. Uh, and kayfabe, right, uh, further renders wrestling as really liminal space, right? It takes the rivalry of these staged characters and makes them real. Um, so Christopher shows us how in this vibrant world of Southern wrestling in the 70s and 80s, that these identities were actually really complex and nuanced. Uh, they, they possess these explicitly political dimensions uh, that shape the culture of the region, but they also don't just fall into easy categories it continues to reinforce, right? So thinking about race, for instance, the, the junkyard dog is a stereotype, but he's also a hero. Uh, in his paper, he talked a little bit more uh, in the written draft about Kamala, the Ugandan giant, who's this constructed exotic, right? He's actually an African-American from Mississippi. Uh, but at kayfabe, these kayfabe narratives that Christopher writes about are not on pure racial lines, right? A lot of times the kayfabe, the rivalries between two black wrestlers, for instance. So race obviously matters here, but not in a simple black and white dichotomy, right? Uh, the same might be true with global politics, right? He talks about uh, uh, the Japanese wrestler Tojo Yamamoto, the, the Arab Skandar Akbar, the Russian Nikolai Volkov. Uh, so xenophobia is driving the construction of these heels. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, especially in his written paper, Christopher got a little bit more at the um, complexities of this by talking about some of the Hispanic wrestlers in this circuit. Uh, they weren't constructed as heels in the exact same way. And perhaps that was due to the popularity of, of Mexican wrestling, uh, perhaps to Hispanic audiences. Uh, it was an interesting uh, point along the way. Chris's paper was most interested in unpacking the meaning of the fabulous Freebirds, right, who embody this sort of populist white Southern identity. Uh, they have the association with the Leonard Skinner song, uh, they've got the long hair, and they got the Confederate flags, the working class style. There's a contrast to the Von Erics, who are kind of like the aristocrats of the Southern uh, wrestling world. Uh, and clearly this is plugging into an emerging politics of the era, right? Uh, if you think of the George Wallace campaigns of 1968 and 1972, uh, Richard Nixon's silent majority, where, where he co-ops many of these Southern voters, Southern white voters who went for Wallace in 68, uh, who become part of the Reagan coalition by, in 1980, if you think again about Reagan's uh, campaigning and, and where he did so well. But again, as Christopher forces us to think about the complexity, the, the Freebirds, they might have began as baby faces, but they are mostly heels, right? Uh, villains. And uh, that is seems to be the, the, the most important theme to continue to unpack uh, as this goes forward. Uh, this needs, uh, it's, a, it's such a key insight, but it needs more analysis and development. How do the fans react to them? Uh, what does that tell us? 
Uh, can we paint more scenes on the ground of the free birds to help us understand this, right? Or their style, their self-presentation, what their bouts were like, their interactions with fans, fan reaction, who's cheering, who's booing. Uh, do the fans themselves identify with the heels? I, 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 I think there's more to do with react with audience response here, uh, as well as how the free birds present themselves. And I think that could add another layer to this ongoing discussion, right? Uh, as all three papers emphasize, sports don't just portray narratives of the Sunbelt Sun Belt, Sun Belt South. They're also part of the region's larger narrative itself. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over to Derek. No, thank you, Aaron. Those are, I think, fantastic comments. I want to add, because I, I, I don't want to take up all the time, and I see at least one question in the Q&A. And, and so I want to say a couple of things that I, I think just as broad strategies that I'd like to see moving forward that I saw in all three papers. One is, um, and Aaron, you hinted at this uh, with the Freebirds. How, what is the, fa like, in, in all three papers, I think we really got an understanding of the structure of how uh, your approach. So whether it's in Chuck's paper, looking at the boosters and Kate's paper, looking at the university and the city, how it's understanding itself and uh, Chris's paper, looking at uh, the the bookers and the owners of the, the various regions. But how do the fans react and what are the differing kind of reactions uh, across race? I think the question uh, that Aram asked about uh, Harvey Gantt, about how does the black community, you know, come out, uh, you know, how do their vote, do their votes change for this bond initiative? How, do, how are they envisioning uh, this being a first class city? How do they take even to um, uh, to some of the black players uh, on some of these teams, right? Uh, most famously, uh, and this is my, this is personally selfish, right? Jim McDaniels is a, is a, is really uh, a star here at Western in Western Kentucky, right? And he's the first pick, and you know, um, of that club. But he 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 leaves mid season, right, uh, to go to Seattle into uh, the NBA, and so there speaks to the kind of not only the the challenges financially, but also, you know, what how are white fans envisioning these black athletes as part of the way that they imagine a first class city? Kate, for you, um, uh, this is kind of my wheelhouse, so I know a lot. I probably know more about Miami than I probably need to. Um, but your point about tourism. Uh, you know, how does the the that Florida a and I talk about this in my book, this Florida A&M has the Orange Blossom Classic, which from 47 to to 19, I want to say 79 uh, is played in Miami every single year. And it is really for the black community, the defining uh, event, tourist event, the first Saturday in December that allows for the black community to in many ways participate in the same kind of tourism that come to define the Orange Bowl. And so, you know, I think there's something to be said about the fact that you can't get the the you of the 1980s that how and Stella murder moves into until you have this kind of decline of Florida a and Like there's a space for, for those folks to come in. Um, I think most notably about someone like Traz Powell, who was a longtime teacher at Northwestern, I believe, at Booker T. Washington and Northwestern, a football coach who is a Florida a and alum. Uh, you know, what do we see these black coaches in, in facilitating someone like these players, Highsmith and Bratton? Uh, I think Highsmith's dad actually played at Florida A&M. And so there's making a conscious decision to say, oh, you, you're going to reject this legacy and move and play for the University of Miami. Uh, I think there's a, there, I think there's something to be to that that kind of needs to be teased out a little bit in understanding the broader. Because when you put the McDuffie riots on top of that, now you have to figure out how does your racial identity play itself out now that you're in this space that is Coral Gables. Um, Chris, I think that, I think that the, the, the way that the, that wrestling constructs these cities, uh, constructs and reconstructs and uses these, um, these caricatures in these cities uh, is fascinating to think about. Uh, and I think as Aaron points out, the fabulous free birds as, as a heel, um, what does it mean? Are there are the are the identities and caricatures? Do they differ from region to? You talk about this trans Mississippi region, but is there something that more, that's more effective in say Memphis than it is in Charlotte, right? And how do we understand some of these subtle regional differences? I think that in total, all three of these papers speak to. Uh, Aaron, you talked about this, the second class, the second tier and sometimes third tier cities, right? 
And I think that that sport is so important in the way that all these cities imagine themselves, even cities that then eventually become first here, whether it's Houston or Atlanta. Um, uh, but the question of, you know, Memphis, uh, uh, Charlotte, uh, Miami, Louisville, uh, Nashville, right? These are all that next tier cities that are often grasping at these fleeting leagues. I think there's a whole argument to be made about uh, when you look at the ABA, for instance, how, you know, like look at where all these teams, you know, the Kentucky Colonels are out of Louisville and you've got, you know, the St. Louis and you've got the, um, you know, you've got all these San Antonio, like we have Indianapolis, we have cities that, that, that were not Boston or New York or Chicago. Uh, and I think that part of these, this identity, this national identity, but also regional identity is so much rooted into sports. And what was not really clear, I think Kate was probably the closest, is how the civil rights, how these, these cities in particular imagine the civil rights movement as part of their projection of this sports series. Um, you know, a city like Memphis always struggles uh, Aaron knows this. It's, it's the place where King was killed, right? And so it has a hard time projecting. But like a city like Atlanta is, you know, it was too busy to hate, a city too busy to hate. And I think that when you think about um, both uh, uh, Charlotte, which is a city that is that banking kind of projects this similar kind of image to Atlanta, and Miami always sells its diversity in a particular way, right? That it's like, look how diverse we are. Uh, UM says, well, we're not going to segregate because we've had Latino students at UM since the 30s. Uh, and so how do we explain and justify this? And so they part of their selling themselves and selling the city is an international city. Um, one of your one of your slides, Kate, had uh, of the Orange Bowl had all these international flags on it. And it's very much the way Miami constructs itself. And so thinking about how these sports are so integral in the way that they're defining themselves, but their future, but also how they define their past. And so something like the McDuffie riots interrupts that. Whereas in Charlotte, you know, how do we see the busing crisis, you know, transform their push for a city? How does wrestling play into the ways in which we see some of these, you know, the key stops, right, in, in, in the various uh, in the various markets, New Orleans, uh, Memphis, Atlanta, Charlotte, how do those cities, how does wrestling and, and those caricatures and stereotypes, how do they affect the way they imagine? Um, before we go, I'm going to let you guys come in. I got one question, uh, and, and uh, uh, LaShonda Mims asks, wants to know how your research, today's research fits into a larger project because um, she's selfishly interested in your project, Chuck. That's, what, that's, that's exactly in the thing. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to respond. Uh, and I'll start with you, Kate, if you want to add anything here and then we'll work our way around and we'll wrap it up. OK, first of all, I just want to say thank you both so much, Aram and Derek, for your wonderful comments. And again, Chuck, for putting this panel together and Chris for I mean, your amazing work as well. I'm honored to be a part of it. And to answer your question, it's a great question, LaShonda. And I actually enjoyed when Aram was talking about Two Life Crew. So the very next chapter of this work is on Two Life Crew and their relationship to the team and connecting that. And so it is a part of a larger project called um, In the Eyes of the Hurricane. So it's Miami football race and American conservatism. So looking at the larger moment, and as Derek mentioned, um, an international moment. And so really the central uh, questions of the larger work is to explore the shift from 1962, when Miami and the Orange Bowl was used to welcome white tourists and white Cubans. So looking at that moment with JFK and, and he's in the Orange Bowl and he's using the stadium in a particular way. Um, and then moving to the 1980s as a space of continuum for black men and black cultural expression. So looking at black Mario Cubans at, who are housed as the Orange Bowl as a detention site, as well as its relationship to Two Life Crew and all of that. So it's a part of a, a larger project on this relationship of the built environment of sport, the, the football program of the 1980s and uh, the larger historical moment, as Derek said, this really post civil rights racial moment and how the black athlete is participating in this and really confounding what blackness means, right? In an international city like Miami because of the role of the black Cuban, because of the athletes themselves. And so Aram's call to bring in those biographies more prominent is really important to, you know, this transnational view of blackness as well. So thank you, LaShonda. Chris. Oh, I'm next. I'm sorry. Uh, That's all right. 
I, I was just uh, waiting for Kate to to finish there, and uh, thank you for the uh, for the suggestions. I I, I think it's wonderful uh, wonderful suggestions, and kind of combining. Uh, I can do a hell of a lot more with the free birds, but. Similar to Kate, uh, I have a separate chapter which kind of examines professional wrestling's role within the civil rights movement. However, I can very much see uh, adding to this chapter how the different cities imagine themselves at, in the 70s and 80s. That's something that I can easily do and incorporate it. And it's something that I really didn't Think about because uh, as as Chuck knows, I'm, I've mostly resided in in the 19th century in the antebellum era. I'm a recent convert, so to speak, but uh, I can definitely look at more how the Freebirds, because professional wrestling is very much a lot like other sports in that it differs from city to city. And I'm also fascinated by this notion of second and third tier cities. I don't know much about it. I, I can get with Chuck because he's the expert, but I think you've tapped into something here because this is where a lot of these second and third, these smaller towns and cities uh, is where a lot of these territories are going and making money too, in addition to the Houstons, the New Orleans. So uh, thank you for the, the, the great direction. I'm, I'm definitely going to chase adding to this chapter because I do think I wouldn't even have to change the title because it's identity, right? It's regional identity, but it's, it's, it's city, it's urban identity. So, and it's something, uh, and I have a question for everyone. Uh, did everybody understand the context, the, the, the use of the term populism? Because I really haven't found someone who, or some article or book that articulates a definition beyond just what emerged in the late 19th century with the Farmers Alliance, along with this sort of catch-all term that refers to the uh, uh, refers to to not only the political culture of racism, but but this economic angst. So, do you think that's a, a, that's a useful term? Because I do define it in the introduction. That was just a question to everybody. Anybody? No, I think. Well, I'll just jump in real quick. I think. I think you. Um, I think that there's a a whole lot of. I mean, I guess the question of populism has to be teased out from massive resistance, right? Like, in, if you think about the civil rights movement, uh, and maybe Aaron can, can can think think about this a little differently than I do, but I think of. Of, of not just the racism and the populism and economics, but I do think that when we look at, I think the scholarship on the Sun Belt does a very good job of breaking us from kind of the massive resistance of a place like Birmingham, right, to to the, the anti-busing movement, right? I am talked about this that Nixon really taps into with the Southern strategy. Um, you know, I imagine that that's the same kind of folks who are attending wrestling and rooting for particular uh, you know, particular kinds of, of, of characters is the right word. I mean, wrestlers. Um, yes. and, and I think that that's, you know, I think that there's a certain kind of populism in that. Um, but I do think it's also complicated in the ways in which those same white people didn't want their kids going to school, but they would then root for the junkyard dog, right? Like, they're, like all those kinds of race. I, mean, I think sports allows for that kind of ambiguity, um, that we see quite regularly, um, Kate sees this, you know, folks don't want you living in Coral Gables, but they love the University of Miami even, you know, and so I think those kinds of uh, contradictions exist. And I think they exist probably even clearer in, in wrestling because of the emotional uh, factor that wrestling is actively trying to tap into. Yeah, I think Derek has, has got at it. Uh, you know, you might want to Go back and reference a little bit more Michael Kazin's book, The Populist Persuasion. Um, he makes the big case about how populism is you know, more, more or less the language of the left from the late 19th uh, century through the world, World War II, and then shifts, beginning with McCarthyism, but then really through the Wallace movement into the language of the right. And, and that obviously has really significant 
uh, dimensions for your project, right? And thinking about Southern white populism in, in that era. Uh, you might also want to think about Charles Hughes's book, Country Soul, which is about music, uh, but uh, talks to that same sort of idea of white Southern identity and the complexities of it. And how, like, as Derek was suggesting in terms of how you can cheer for um, a junkyard dog, like here in Memphis, like there's no one who is a greater hero to whites and blacks than a guy named Larry Finch, who was the star of the basketball team that went to the finals in 1973. But 1973 is also the same year when Memphis's busing crisis hits and there's a, and there's more racial polarization than, than the city has seen since King was assassinated five years earlier. Um, so all that to say is, um, I think just to keep teasing out that uh, both what populism means uh, in your particular context, but also you know the great strength of your paper, and the and but where the, the theme that really needs to keep being developed is not just um, that these wrestlers can can adopt this complex identity, but why uh, they're doing so and how that's happening. Uh, the more you get at that, uh, the stronger your project becomes in my in my mind. Thank you. Sure. Thank you the suggestions chuck yes okay uh thanks to uh airman derek for i mean this is wonderful feedback this really i needed this to kind of get get going and and keep digging into the different layers of, of the uh, of the project um for uh, for dr uh, mims um I'm, I'm interested to hear about your work on charlotte uh i am Right now, I'm kind of envisioning this uh, as a book project that's going to stretch from the end of World War II up through the early 2000s when the Hornets uh, leave the city and, and, and George Shen uh, is a man in shame um, with, the, uh, with the departure of, of, of the team uh, and his own personable, personal foibles. Um, along the way, uh, I, I want to really dig into these different layers of sport, uh, particularly more of an emphasis on race, a lot with class. And, and that's where professional wrestling you know, is going to be a part of what I talk about in Charlotte uh, because of a major promotion headed, uh, headed out of Charlotte. Um, and, and looking at, looking at the, the intersections of race and class with these bigger questions about urban, urban identity. Um, Derek, you mentioned uh, Jim McDaniels. Uh, I've, I've got a good bit on Jim McDaniels kind of in my files so far, but uh, when I when I look at the Cougars really from an internal perspective of the team and how the team evolved, he's definitely going to be a major player because he was he was a lightning rod in the uh, in the sports pages and the editorials. Um, in fact, uh, one uh, I didn't include this quote in here, but one of the one of the members of Charlotte's local media who was talking about how the, how the Cougars never really connected with the fans pointed to Jim McDaniels and, and really kind of, you know, getting into certain stock types of selfish players, um, greed and, and things like that. So, you know, certainly Jim McDaniels is going to be, be part of the, uh, of the larger story uh, along with um, Billy Cunningham um, uh, is, is a big part, part of that story as, as well. And the connection with, you know, what, what connection did the city have with the fans? Well, what they did have was, was through people like Billy Cunningham who had played at the university of North Carolina in, in the sixties. Um, but, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to, to really, uh, really, uh, kind of branch this out, dig deeper. Um, you know, the, the question is going to be about, about length and coverage. I, I've, I've already made the decision. I, I don't, unless I get feedback from others who think I should, I, I'm, I'm really going to stay away from high school athletics in this project and keep the focus really on, you know, the, the, the commercial ranks of college and, and, and professional. Um, that's really where I'm going to be um, keeping my focus for that. But um, no, I, I really, really appreciate all the feedback. Well, I want to say uh, to everyone, thank you for participating. Thank those folks who were listening. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, like Aram said in his opening, that it is unfortunate that we cannot follow this up with a fantastic meal in New Orleans. Uh, and so, uh, but to the next time I get to see everyone in face-to-face -face at our next conference, where and whenever that may be, uh, please have safe travels and, 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 and have a happy holiday uh, season. Um, again, thank you for your fantastic scholarship. Aaron, thank you for your fantastic comments and, and those who are uh, in watching this, 
uh, now and later. Thank you for taking the time out to, to listen to these fantastic scholars. Uh, everyone have a uh, beautiful day. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Y'all have a nice day.